would love to be Calvin Harris, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, one of the hot topics in the oil field at the moment is digitization. And because as an industry, we are very insular, we don't like to look outside what other industries do, I do. It means we're about 10 years behind everyone else. And almost 40 behind Boston. The most important challenge the world now faces is how to understand and shape new technologies that are emerging. And what they will do is nothing less than transform humankind. We are at the beginning of a phase that is going to fundamentally change the way we work, live, communicate. It's just, it's incredible. I get really excited by what's going on. And we're part of a generation that are going to see a historic change. And part of that is just the scale, the speed, the complexity of what's happening. I mean, people talk about the Industrial Revolution, but you know what? This is not an Industrial Revolution because there was never a cognitive development before. This is fundamentally different. This is an evolution, right? So, does anyone anyone here identify as a, as a bit of a nerd or a bit of a, a geek? It's all right. You're in a sport group. You can put your hand up if you want. Yeah? Can, you, can anyone here code? No, can you write uh, Python node? Even, even basic, right? Or VBA or whatever. You know? Okay? Right. Once upon a time, being able to code was the domain of the nerds and the geeks. But for me, being able to code is a skill that you should learn with reading, writing, and doing math. And unless you are able to understand the digital revolution at quite fundamental level, you are going to fall by the wayside and become obsolete. Now that's quite a big thought really, isn't it? As I said, we are seeing the next stage of mankind's evolution and there are a few futurists out there that will probably agree with that. Or I should say I'm agreeing with that. To give you a bit of perspective, uh, an example from our industry, within five years, there will be a tool below the rotary table, commercially available, that will make directional drilling decisions with an onboard AI using information gathered directly from the MWD tool before the, that data makes it to surface. Again, it's quite, a, it's quite a big thing, isn't it? We're talking about automated drilling here, where you need somebody there to make tools, and that is it. He'll probably be gone once you introduce a robotic drill for In terms of the wider world, imagine the power of having billions of people connected by billions of devices. It's just incredible. The, the processing power, the storage capability, What's going to change? It's, it's we're right on the cusp of all of this happening. And again, we're all sort of seeing a confluence of a whole range of technologies. Artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, autonomous cars, 3D printing, nanotechnology, uh, digital twins. Sorry? Digital twins. Absolutely. So, and the thing is, this technology growth accelerates constantly because they compound and leapfrog and just unite to accelerate growth all these technologies with zero long. I don't really want to use that word, but amplify. Sorry, that's the word I was looking for because they all amplify one another. 
we are witnessing profound shifts across all industries. And like I was saying, massive changes in the way that we live and work. And never before has humankind been in a stage with greater potential or the greater potential for peril. Because we really don't know what's going to happen. We can guess. And it just it sort of depends whether you've got positive or negative value as to what you think is going to happen. But for me, one of the major concerns I have is our industry leadership. Most of the industry leaders that we've had were born, raised, and matured in a time where stability was the norm, where the stock market was on the sort of general growth, and companies that you know, were around for centuries, right? That's what the GE is. We're not in those times anymore. We're in times when the leadership and the people who will be coming through were raised in instability, in times of not chaos, but rapid, accelerated change. And I don't want to sound revolutionary, I'm not going out with pitchforks, but there's going to be a massive generational shift. There's going to be key to the growth in the oil field and the, the, the adaption to the digital way of thinking because you need to accept that change is happening and change only accelerates. Uh, okay, so over the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about some things I think are really important and that get me excited um, about my career as it continues to become. And I'm not going to tell you what to do because I don't know what your strengths and stuff are. I'm going to give for a few few things out there, and it's up to you to cherry pick and think what you are interested in and what you want to follow, okay? Right, hang on. Pop quiz. <laughs> this is participation exercise, guys, by the way. Um, shout out if you know these people. Sorry, I, there are people there not shouting out. If you don't know Steve Jobs, <laughs> you are a liar. <laughs> Liars. Right, come on, shout out and join in. Steve Jobs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well done. I thought this was going to be a bit more difficult. Anyone know this guy? What's <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> Who's this lady? Fucking awesome. The name's coming up. <laughs> How many? Oh, so okay. So in all seriousness, most people, most of you probably knew the first or well, four or five. Four. I think it's probably pretty reasonable. Um, so Sundar Pichai, who is he? Does anyone know? Google is right here, and he's awesome, right? I love him. He's absolutely amazing. Right, afterwards. Um, <laughs> so, how about uh, Caitlin Small? Anybody know who she is? Anyone? You watch her product every day. I guarantee you. She is the VP in charge of data engineering at Netflix. She's the woman behind the algorithm that chooses what you're going to watch. Okay? Um, how about Andrew Jassy? He is CEO of AWS. And, uh, sorry, my pronunciation is absolutely terrible. Demi uh, Hassabis. Does anybody know who he is? Right. Did any of you play the game Theme Park when you were little? Yep. Yeah? Okay, so he wrote that game. And, but what he's most famous now is the company DeepMind. This guy is doing some, well, not this guy. Then uh, Dennis is doing some incredible work. It was worth reading about. Uh, he did a, an interview a couple of days ago, radio, which was just mind blowing. Anyway, the guy that I actually want to talk about is this guy, Thomas Petrofi. Anybody ever heard of this guy? Now, for me, his story is generally his story is incredible. He 
he came across from Hungary where he escaped the communists. Um, and after this, I would strongly recommend you go out and read a little bit about it because he was very excited. <laughs> but I'm going to take you back to 1987. And an employee of the NASDAQ, I don't know his real name, so I'm just going to call him Ryan Jones. Jones was on his way to go visit the NASDAQ's, one of the NASDAQ's fastest growing customers, Timber Hill. And as he walked into the elevator, he pressed the button, he started to think about how they consistently outperform the market. Did they have the youngest, brightest, hottest white males? Because Wall Street is famous and diverse, right? Um, or did they have the best research department? Or was it simpler than that? Did they just take huge gambles and win? Did they have incredible amounts of luck? So, as it gets to Timber Hill's trade, Jones puts his hand on the door and goes in. And he expects to see a trading floor. Testosterone driven chaos. Shouting. You've all seen like Wolf of Wall Street and so on, right? Yeah? Yeah, yeah? That's what he expected to see. But the thing is, Timber Hill wasn't run by a triple, uh, sorry, typical Wall Street broker. In fact, he wasn't even trading. Thomas Petrofi was a programmer. And no commotion of timber in the trading floor, no ringing phones, no dot matrix printers going. <laughs> All there was was an IBM and one low NASDAQ terminal. And what Petrofi had done was he spliced the data cable going from the NASDAQ terminal into his IBM. With art, where the computer was running algorithms that Petrofi had written and was interpreting the data from the terminal to decide what were good and bad trades and send those trades back to the NASDAQ terminal before a human trader could even read the data. 1987, guys. Complex data sets to do with stock market predictions in 1987. This is what I mean by we're almost 40 years behind Wall Street. Now, does anybody want to guess how many trades in the US stock market are made without human involvement, purely algorithmically? Guess. More than 95%. Uh, you're a bit extreme, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's, a good, that's a super guess, actually. Uh, anybody else? 75. Sorry, 35? 75. 75. You're pretty much spot on. It's 80%. Okay, 80% of trades on the stock market never see a human and don't have any human input. Um, input. That's incredible, isn't it? Does that, that hurt my brain? Um, so, does anybody. Oh, sorry, this is a slide I'm supposed to show you what we're talking about mostly. Um, no, these are. I guess. What are you speaking? Financial prices. Sorry? Financial prices. No, but you're you're thinking one of the right lines. What if I give you these hints? Money spoons, right? So the reason I talk about money spoons is we are in the middle of one of the moments. Does anybody know objectively smart, objectively speaking? How do you guess what the most valuable commodity in the world at the moment is? Data. Sorry? Data. Exactly. Did, did everyone hear that? Yeah. Data. Data is the most valuable commodity in the world at the moment. And you're maybe wondering why I'm not talking to you about data acquisition technologies, which I, I, I haven't mentioned so far. You wonder why? Because the oil industry is cracked. Total crap at using data. The this 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 statistic blew my mind. Right, Baker Hughes have done a joint venture with um, C3.ai. Do you know what they estimate is the 
what percentage of data that is gathered is actually used by the industry? Click yes. Five. Ten. No, it's less. Wait, you said five. Three. It's three. It is three percent. That's embarrassing, right? Initially, when I was when I heard that, I was shocked. I was really embarrassed. I mean, actually, but when I looked at my own experience, I thought about actually how much I used my my job. Probably about right. I wasn't surprised when I really thought about it. But the data is used to project your picture of the world. How accurate do you think our picture of what's going on in the world industry actually is? It's massively skewed. But, sorry, a bit of a tangent there. Uh, but the thing is, data, like oil, has no value until it's processed. It needs to be refined, turned into fuel, chemicals, plastics. And that is when oil has its true value. And it's the same with data. Data is meaningless. I mean, the, the human brain is staggeringly ill-equipped to deal with processing large volumes of raw data. I mean, although you're right, we, we've taken constantly the process of that, but anybody here with data, uh, looking at sort of doing data analytics or anything in the oil industry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so human brain just can't process it. Um, so, what that says to me is the entity, by which I mean company or individual, that controls, writes, and owns the algorithms that process the data, control how the data is seen, and what picture is produced by the data. Is that more powerful than data acquisition? The control of the image that people see of the world? I'd say so. So, what data and algorithms enable is rapid decision making with large data sets at scale and complex decisions, right? Especially as we, we start to become more sophisticated and some of the new emerging technologies really take off. Um, and speaking of new emerging technologies, the things are only going to get cheaper and faster, right? So, does anyone know the price of storing one gig of data in the cloud in 1999? Shout out. 200? No. Way off. Way off. Sorry? No, way too high. Last <laughs> Sorry? Small price because in 1999 people didn't care about storing the data. Well, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 yes, I, I accept that. Perhaps the question. No, it was, I, I accept what you're saying. The, the sort of logic makes sense, but you'll know, read them off. It was $10,000. <laughs> okay. Does anybody know? Right, so I got an email last week from Asus saying we will give you one terabyte of storage in the cloud. Do you know how much they charged me? I Less can't. than double. Sorry? Less than one dollar. No, it, thirteen dollars, yeah. which works out to be one point three cents per gigabyte. Okay? So it's thinking how much? One point three cents per gigabyte per year with unlimited access. It's incredible, isn't it? So this is what technology is doing. This is how fast it's going, this is how cheap it's become in twenty years. Um Sorry, I'm going back there. The, uh, again, the sort of going back to algorithms, and that's why I believe that algorithms are much more important for you folks on, because by controlling algorithms, you control how the world perceives the data that we are requiring constantly, and we're going to get more and more of it. The devices we wear are constantly monitoring us when we live, when we sleep, when we live. Constantly acquiring data. It's a little bit scary, it's actually quite exciting as well. Um, so, 
what is an algorithm? Now, that usually has a big impact when you take the little models. But, um, right, has anyone heard of the, the German uh, mathematician and philosopher Leibniz? Put your hands up if you have. I can't see you nodding. Okay. Now, I really recommend you go check this guy out because his philosophy is really interesting and actually has quite a lot of bearing on computational decision making. 250 years before Turing was born. Okay? So, my point here is that algorithms are not the new thing. They have been around for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and they're, they're simple. It's a mechanical process you follow to get a desired outcome. Information goes in and an answer comes out. Simple, isn't it? I mean, everyone thinks algorithms are really complicated, mostly because of the buzzwords. They're not they're, they're not really simple. And it's not that simple. And essentially what that makes them is binary decision. Oh, the series binary decisions are massive decision trees, essentially at the end of the day. Or small decision trees, depending on how complex they are. And the thing is, the thing is, every decision making process you make as a human being can be broken down into a series of binary decisions. Every single one, from what to have for lunch, to doing the laundry, to choosing a partner. Okay? Incidentally, that's the algorithm for choosing a partner. Um, very simplified, but... Let's, let's look at... Uh, Doing the laundry, okay? We'll have two inputs. Fabric type and weight of the laundry. So you can see here from this really basic code that if the weight is greater than five, we'll have a high level of laundry. And if we have full, we'll have full washing with full bricks. Okay? Simple, right? Two inputs. Very limited variability. But look how many potential outputs we have. So, algorithms can be quite simple. But what if we start to throw in detergent, colors, um, pre soaking, spin? Uh, what can the stain of these? Something starts to become quite complex, right? I mean, to be honest, this level of complexity is in the bar beyond most sort of first year uh, IT, not IT, computer science students, there's a very easy way to do it. But it can scale. So let's think about the level of complexity of Petrofi's code, where he was taking in huge amounts of data from the stock market and trying to predict the stock market price. So, And that is a real, that is a real trick to programming, is being able to take the human experience, the human knowledge, and transfer it into an algorithm, and write that algorithm effectively in code. It's a lot more difficult than the science. It, hundreds of variables, billions of nodes. But it is really cool, it's really powerful. Anyone, uh, Potential reservoir engineers, put up your hands. Anyone else? Geologists? It's okay, you can admit it. I, I put geologists on uh, not one of them. Um, petroleum engineers. Okay. Wow, The rest of you guys are like gang up your outnumbered points a year. Okay. Um, imagine. Imagine that you 
didn't have to depend on Excel and MATLAB. Imagine that you could write your own programs, pull in data however you wanted. You could then build them up and then add into those programs relatively easily. Um, machine learning from like Watson uh, or Azure or, or AWX. Relatively easily done. You can start and then you can pull in vastly different data sets. You're not limited by the same programs that your peers are because as good as Excel is, not for the modeling that you want to do. You can start to do quite sophisticated and exciting uh, interpretation. It starts to get quite interesting. And another thing is that you should you should really consider is that we'll again I'll reference the merger between or the joint venture, sorry, between Megafuse and C3 AI, is you have oil field companies. And you have data companies, the data analysis companies. These guys don't speak the same language, right? They might overlap, but they don't really speak the same language. So imagine you had one foot here, another foot here. I mean, you're, you're probably leaning more to the oil field side, right? But having a foot in both camps means you can tell these guys, sorry, you can tell them these guys, what these guys want, and then you come back and you tell these guys why that's not possible because they've grossly under or overestimated the ability of what, what can be done and actually what they want to be done is really, really sophisticated and they don't have a budget for it. But what that makes you is the linchpin. You something critical in the industry that move forward because you are that translation. Um, Okay, so I'm a big advocate of, of sort of algorithms and code, but actually, the digital future is not just about algorithms and code, it's about making work more efficient. And you then start to look at augmented human beings. And what we will have in the future is people that are given devices, software that combines the power of computing with the creativity, the empathy, the emotionality of human beings. Okay? Sorry. Um, But I'm sure when I said augmented humans that most, what most of you thought about was augmented reality. And that is really cool, isn't it? I mean, it is so cool. Uh, so I don't really want to come to augmented reality um, or to about something else, but augmented reality is amazing. I, uh, I get really excited by it. I'm not very, honestly not very knowledgeable about it. But seeing the potential of what it can do, you're enhancing people's vision of the world. You're combining computer-generated text, um, effects, imagery with reality to convert complete uh, an enhanced view of the world. So you can just see more. And for me, I mean, you guys are probably thinking that actually what, what's so cool is being able to play with the product before it goes into prototype, or being able to walk around the module offshore to iron out all the kinks before it goes and they try to install it and go, it doesn't fit. Or, this is new, for me this is quite new. Um, standing in a reservoir and watching it flow around you as the model changes dynamically, and that would be pretty exciting, right? But actually, for me, that's not the most interesting thing. So, I imagine there's going to be some of you who will be doing the skip offshore at some point, or in remote locations. Imagine you're that remote field engineer. You've got a pair of augmented safety specs. And you're there, and a team comes out, and you go, 
crap. And the training was two years ago, and I can't remember. Uh, I'll quickly look at the manual. And then the company back comes along and goes, Do you know what you're doing? And you go, Yes, I do! <laughs> and that happens all the time, guys. Anyone who tells you otherwise is, is naive. Yes, I was trying to be polite. Um, <laughs> imagine a skilled engineer needs tech support or needs support from onshore, and the guy onshore can see what he's seeing, and then you can see what to do by having it visually done in front of you on top of the tool that you're trying to use. For me, this is the real thing about the, the digital revolution is access to information. And the democratization of learning and, and information and all that stuff. I we forget the printing press. This is this is the real when real democratization of learning happens. Anyway, so tradi the traditional model is I go offshore with one of you guys. And I have to be physically present while I mentor you. You are from offshore in my training. But imagine this. I'm onshore and I can mentor you, 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 all of you. And you can all have access to me when you need me. And I can be providing you information as I see the change in life. Um right. So yeah, I didn't really want to talk about it, but I meant to be out of it. The Sorry, I've got to find out where I'm going. I lost my, my train of thought. Um, oh, here we go. Does anyone know Arthur C. Clarke's third law? Uh, where are you, you people that said you're geeks and nerds? Us. Come on, you'll see that in every sci fi movie ever, I promise. You recognize this? No? Really? Of any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And this is where I think we're headed. With augmented reality. Oh, not with augmented reality, with augmented humans. You guys, think about the way you interact with Alexa, Siri, uh, OK Google. You don't even think about it anymore, right? I mean, when I was a kid, we had Star Trek. Not the first one. Right? Not that good. But this is this is basically what we're looking at now. The Star Trek wise It was the year 2050, 50, 50, whatever, whatever, I don't I can't remember. So um, I want to introduce you guys to the most powerful augmented uh, human device on the planet. You put your hand in your pocket. Come on, I said it's a participation event. Put your hand in your pocket and touch your sword phone. Oh, that. Well okay. That is the most powerful augmented reality tool in the world. Okay, you, you, you're all looking a bit skeptical. Um, that device you're holding your hand, you carry in your pocket, a few decades ago, it would have cost. 30 or 40 million dollars, and we're being super, super confusing. Okay. In a few decades' time, you will be wearing, carrying, embedded devices that will be more powerful than all computers connected to the internet right now. <laughs> okay. And the reason it's so powerful is access. 96% of homes in the UK have access to a smartphone. Of people under 30, 80% say the smartphone never leaves their side, i.e. the pocket or the jacket or whatever. 90% say that the smartphone is the last thing they check at night and subsequently the first thing they're there in the morning. It's all about access. And I'd like to demonstrate the power of um, this sort of augmented human. Um, 
Does anyone speak any of these languages as a first language? Okay, does anyone have Google Translate on the phone? Okay, who wants to who wants to come up and volunteer? Ah, come on. Right, cool. I don't need you just yet, but can you get Google Translate and everything ready to go? I'm going to show a quick video and then we'll come up and we'll have a little conversation. Okay, right. No, 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 just, just get ready. Get, get ready. Okay. Um, so I just want to show you this. this. This video. And this is Google Translate. Like it, Google Translate translates over a hundred languages when it's connected to the internet. It does this through my camera. I mean, the, we're a global industry. We go to places where I, I don't speak the language. I can't read menus. I can't read signs. I don't know what to do with immigration. Um, Charles de Gaulle has always been a massive problem for me because they don't really, that's, that's a sort of they don't really have signs in English. Well, they didn't used to, yeah. Right, so I want to show the power of what Google Translate is now, and I've been taking a bit of a, a risk because I would like to have a conversation with an interview who just said, hello, how are we doing? And we'll do it right through Google Translate. And we'll speak in the Okay, ready? Hi, how are you? Oh. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, how are you doing? I'm really good, thank you. I, um, I'm having quite a good time. How about you? People love you. <laughs> I just want to go home because I hate the weather. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Oh, sorry, I just said you hate me. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so The thing is, did you know that Google Translate is available through Google Bytes? Like, obviously, we can make it Bytes. Think about that. Did, how many of you have read um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? We've got Babelfish. Okay? And, but think about the applications in an industry that is globally spread and multilingual as oil industry. I, Think of the number of occasions where I've been giving directions to drillers and telling them what to do, and the driller doesn't speak English, so I have to use my very limited Kurdish or my very limited Polish, or and, and kind of go, "This is what I want you to do." And he goes, mm, "I don't understand your terrible accent." It, it's incredible. Imagine having business meetings where you have people spread all over the world where you don't have to speak in second languages and be sort of quite comfortable with us. Just this. Really, really exciting. Um, and obviously, Google isn't really limited at the moment. It's got about 90% accuracy on uh, conversational discussions, but that's only going to get better as more people use it as it learns, as the translation just gets better. It's going to get better and better and better and better. Um, and eventually, Google's going to take over the world as well. Uh, okay. But the thing is, and I, I'm not going to have to tell you guys this actually, because human augmentation has already got quite high uptake, certainly with my generation and millennial generation. 44% of people are downloading apps regularly to, or augmentation apps to improve their workflows, compared to 18% of Generation X, and, and then Generation Z, you know, where there's, there's no data. But, um, by the way, yes, I am. I think that's for myself to be No generation Z. Uh, generation X. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, so who's up for a race? Who, who, who's, who wants a bit of a challenge here? Anyone? Do you, does anyone recognize 
Je sais pas. Sorry, shut up. I, 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 I don't care about it. Initial oil volume plates. Exactly. So, um, what, what I want someone to do is use that equation, use the data that's here, the recoverable percentage, and use it to calculate the recoverable oil and the value of that recoverable oil. Does anyone think they can do that relatively quickly using all the data that's there? It's all there. Uh, I was hoping someone was going to say yes. It's makes it more about to do a significant less and less. Um, right. Uh, right. Um, I'm just going to share uh, share my screen with you. Okay. Right. Can you see what's going on? Um, <laughs> We'll see what's going on, right? Yeah, can you, can you read it? Yeah. Uh, uh, right, anyway. Um, does anybody know what just happened there? <laughs> so, 30 seconds. Oh, sorry, I don't want to skip on to this just yet. 30 seconds. Because the equation was for 40 units and the area was in kilometers. Yes, exactly. That was part of the point. So, what I did was I took a picture and I sent it to a server using messaging service, which then used um, computer vision to extract the data, combined with APIs, to pull in and convert those well, units into something usable and comparable and return the data to me that I wanted in 30 seconds. And that is really slow because I actually I programmed it that way because uh, I'm involved, so they send stuff, and then I wanted you to be able to see, see the data that came back, and I, I staggered it. All right, that's, um, yeah, it took a while to program but If you're doing something like this one, Regular basis, can you imagine how much more efficient the server become? Um, does anybody know what RPA is? Anyone? Sorry, I thought I heard someone. Uh, uh, robot process automation. So, this video here is by a company called Blue Path, who are very exciting. Uh, I'll just give you a bit of an introduction. Do you know why robots are here? So we are free to do the things we love. So we don't spend hours and days and weeks doing one tedious thing after another. So we have time to think, to be creative, and pursue new ideas. What took hours now takes minutes. What was pretty accurate is now perfectly accurate. Can you imagine what we humans can achieve if we are powered by that kind of speed and accuracy? Robots automate display ads in Google AdWords in three seconds. I take 10 to 30 minutes. So what do I do with the extra time? I strategize. I write. I fine-tune audience targeting so the ad becomes more effective. Robots update legal documents to the latest version at any point of time, so I don't have to. So I get more time to think of complex legal arguments that win. Robots translate customer requests to English and route them accurately to me, so I can spend time offering the best response fast rather than scramble for translations. The truth is, this is the ultimate collaboration, robots and humans. Robots do all the boring backroom stuff, so we don't have to. We can dream big and push ourselves to be our best versions. We can create amazing new things and keep growing our people and our customers. 
I'm going to there because then it gets a bit of the um, So RPA is robot process automation. And by robots, uh, think software, you're thinking how rather than Optimus Prime. Okay? Uh, but unlike how, RPA is not AR. It is a series of defined rules that are developed by experienced personnel to achieve routine process tasks. And sorry, I'm, I know that it's going on a lot longer, but I have gone down a few tangents at the moment. Um, and that, what that means essentially is you can become A, more efficient, and B, you have to do less boring shit. Um, because a bot can do it for you. Think about, I mean, think about when you're planning an operation. So all, all the stuff there's the operations and just because you're planning an operation and executing all the bits that need to be done. It's pretty boring. There's a lot, I mean, who, anyone who will tell you that they enjoy navigating the SAP, preparing equipment requisitions, or completing and reviewing shipping documents is a liar. They are full of it. It is the most boring thing, especially SAP. I'm a real passion for hating SAP. Um, it's really dull. But can you imagine if you automate that whole workflow? You suddenly become more efficient. You are less likely to make mistakes. And it leaves you to do the interesting stuff. The stuff that really engages your brain, gets you going. So, think about what happens as well. Is uh, when you start to augment RPA with uh, new technologies, emerging technologies, cognitive technologies like machine learning, voice recognition, uh, natural language processing, suddenly you've got something really, really, really powerful. Think about, okay, I guarantee that you have interacted with a cognitive powered RPA bot in dealing with um, customer support. The HR, IT, and accounts personnel at every company do you probably deal with the same 10 questions 80% of the time. And it's usually get sort of IT turn it off and turn it back on again, right? Imagine that is powered by bots so that these people can actually focus on really exciting bits of the bits of the that interest. Okay. So, I hope you're starting to get a sort of inkling of where we're going and some of the things you should be thinking about. The last skill set I'm going to talk about is the most important one. If you haven't listened to anything I've said, this is a bit of a useful thing to do. Okay? Your soft skills. Your soft skills so important. Your technical skills are yeah, really important, otherwise you wouldn't be here studying the technical sciences, right? You wouldn't be studying engineering and, and, and so on. But skills in the technical part will be your soft skills. Think about the people that really inspire you, people in business that you really admire. They, they're not where they are because of their Technical ability. They're there whether they are because of their emotional intelligence, their ability to communicate. Um, Steve Jobs, I, I don't know, I kind of like him to take on. But the reason that he was so influential is because he mastered the power of the analogy. That quote I had at the very start is just brilliant. Where he, he explains a very complex idea in a paragraph. His idea of putting an iPad, oh sorry, an iPod has 10,000 songs in your pocket while Zoom were doing We have one gig of data that you can use to store your songs. Come on, which one do you remember? Why? That's why I, uh, iPod kicked Zoom's ass. Um, those of you who don't know Zoom is Microsoft's version. Uh, okay, so soft skills. Um, and actually, the way I'm going to demonstrate how important soft skills are is presentation skills, okay? So, how many of you enjoy going to business presentations? No one. 
That's because most presentations are done in a rush, with little effort, and which the presenter hasn't prepared for. They are full of bullet points and block text, which aren't intended to convey information so much as to serve as points for the presenter to read off the screen. God, I thought of this so often because the presentation was just, just reading and you're there for hours and hours and hours and it's not that much effort to be a little bit better. And you just have to be a little bit better, right? You want to be, you want to be this guy and your whole audience looking like this. Not really. You're just putting a little bit of effort and a bit of preparation. And to be honest, that is what your stuff seems to be all about. And the ones that I, I really recommend you work on are stuff like communication, um, presentations, social and self-awareness. Oh, God, what else? Um, sorry, I'm going to burn apart. Uh, problem solving stuff like that. I, and the thing is, confidence. Confidence is a really big one. So where can you practice these soft skills in a relatively safe environment? With your friends. Sorry? With your friends. With your friends, that's a good one. I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Um, but actually, I would recommend you join the drama group. You get to practice presentations. You're presenting yourself, talking, communication. It's really important. And again, guys that you, you admire, maybe they don't probably have some sort of coach, but it's the same skill set when you're working on it. I also really recommend, not necessarily your friends, <laughs> but your networking. I honestly, most people don't enjoy networking. I, I know I don't. Particularly, I would work quite hard to go and do it. Um, but the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And initially, it is a little bit stressful, you're pretty uncomfortable, and. Oh, what am I going to talk about? I don't know. And then ask questions. Jesus. A little bit of preparation, a little bit of practice, you become, become very easy. And then you just, then you just sort of. It becomes easier. You don't maybe necessarily enjoy it. Uh, Another thing is in your workplace, right? You have loads of opportunities to practice your soft skills because nobody else wants to do it. The you can have lunch and learn. You, you can, you you can exactly. I was just about to say, if somebody says, "Do you want to do a presentation?" You know what you do. You say, "Yes, I will do it." Two reasons: you're practicing your soft skills, and secondly, you're sticking your boss's mind because everybody else will. No way! And the thing is, when you're standing up there presenting, nobody, none of the guys up there, they're not going, oh, he stumbled over that word, he must not know what he's talking about. They're going, thank Christ, that isn't me. I'm so glad he agreed to do it, or she agreed to do it. That's the reality of the situation. As much as you're going, oh, God, this is horrible. Um, and then pitching ideas to your boss and interesting technologies and um, different ways of doing things. Pitching and selling your ideas are really important as well. So your sales skills, as much as I hate to admit it, sales guys are sometimes right. You, everything is not selling. Um, and back to coding, actually. Back to coding, that problem solving. And again, back to Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs famously said, I think that everyone in this country should learn how to program a computer because it teaches you to think. And it's some same skills you guys are learning in engineering. You break down large, complex problems, which means you've got to understand them. You've got to be able to explain what the problem is. You've got to analyze it. You break it down into small pieces. But you then go, right, how can I fix these small pieces? Okay, pull it all together. How can I pull it all together? You go, ah, right, okay, then. Ah. Crap, it doesn't work. And then you go back and do it again. But it teaches you how to think. So this evening I looked at some of the key elements on how to future-proof your career in the oil field. And 
that's algorithms and code and how to analyze the phenomenal amount of data that's going to be gathered and used, um, utilizing emerging technologies such as RPA to improve your working efficiencies and become part of that augmented workforce. And joining a drama club in order to improve your soft skills, your present sca presentation skills and your emotional intelligence, empathy, humility and so on. And if you do all this, your career in the future is going to be fine, right? The thing is, what I realized while I was writing this presentation is that I'm wrong. Um, and there is no doubt that we are going to see a seismic shift in the oil field as the fourth industrial revolution pr truly kicks in, just as we've seen in all other industries. Digitization is going to fundamentally change the way that companies operate. And this includes their skill set requirements and the way they recruit. What I realized is the only thing that is certain in a future job market is the requirements are going to change. And the speed of that change is going to accelerate. So, how do you future-proof your career under these circumstances? My conclusion is that there's only one skill that all people need to learn, and that is the ability to learn continuously. Being able to demonstrate your ability to learn and adapt is going to be critical in the future. It's always been really important, but as the industry moves on, it will become more and more so. It's impossible to have all the skills that you're going to need. I mean, the likelihood is the job that you're going to be doing doesn't even exist yet. So, how can you have the skill set that's going to be required? But you can improve your ability to learn. So, to future-proof your career, you need to demonstrate to your employers that not just that you can manage change, but that you can embrace it, that you enjoy it, that you're agile, that you can adapt, learn and refocus and stay on the leading edge of change. That is how your career will continue to thrive. Thank you very much. Yeah, it covers all the topics that I've been talking about tonight. Don't meant to be, the, the coding. Um, has anyone read any of the, the three Harari books up there? Anyone? Which one? Over there. So has anyone, anyone else read any of the Harari books? I would put those at the top three on my reading list. The rest in no particular order, but Harari is amazing. And he, he's, a, he's a military historian, but he's, he's absolutely brilliant. Um, this is a this is a book of philosophy uh, about how different cultures think. Um, the second machine age and machine platform crown also brilliant. Uh, automate this. Um, please don't read that one because you'll realise where I've got in front of my presentation tonight from. Um, and soft skills, soft skills, um, and just how to think. This one's quite interesting by Hannah Fry. Uh, who is telling you how to exist in a digital world uh, as machines take over. Um, so what was the one we were talking about before, Tio? Like the... Uh, what to do when machines do everything for you. Yeah, which is also, I haven't read it, but it is on my reading list, which is huge. Um, has anyone got a photo? Yes. Okay. I will answer any questions as best I can.